Maria Konopinska was a translator, a novelist and a poet. Her poem Rota is one of the best known Polish patriotic hymns usually performed during official state ceremonies. Her stories for, and poems for children, such as O Krasnoludkach i Środce Marysi or Pimpuś Sadełko, are considered classics of Polish children's literature. Elisa Rzeszkowa was a writer whose novels constitute the basis of Polish positivism literature. She's the author of, among others, novels like Marta, Nad Niemnem, Meir Azofowicz or Ham. She was a published candidate for the Peace Nobel Prize in Literature twice. In her writings, she supported the emancipation of women, Jews and Serbs. Maria Konopnicka and Eliza Orzeszkowa fates were intertwined throughout their whole lives. They met for the first time in 1855 in a finishing school for girls run by the Benedictine nuns. When Eliza, then Pawłowska, was 14 and Maria, then Wasiłowska, was 13 years old. They both died at the same year, 1910. After they left the boarding school, they haven't seen each other for 20 years. They met again in 1879, when they were both writers and they both had, as one of the biographers puts it, lived quite a bit of an unhappy life. Maria wrote to Eliza later, I feel that I love you. It will be my first love for a woman. I expect a lot of courage, a lot of light, a lot of strength from you. They remained in touch throughout the rest of their lives, through regular letters, if not so much in person. In biographies, you can read that Orzeszkowa and Konopnicka were friends. They supported each other professionally, that much is true. Orzeszkowa was promoting Maria Konopnicka. She organized her jubilee in 1902. Then Konopnicka organized Orzeszkowa's 40th anniversary of uh, artistic work in 1907. They praised each other in letters to one another and to other people. Konopnicka wrote enthusiastic reviews of Orzeszkowa's novels to many newspapers. Orzeszkowa recommended Konopnicka to all of her literary friends with any influence. Eliza wrote about Maria. She is an enormous talent connected with an excellent form of the mind, great thoughts and splendid form. Maria wrote about Eliza. Your novels are cornucopias of thought. They are great because they awake greatness in the minds of the readers. You have the calm and strength of a genius. However, there is not a lot of personal information in their letters. They were very rarely writing about the hardships, of which there were many, and they really rarely met in person. Their acquaintance seems to be a tactical alliance of two extraordinary women who did not fit into the mould of propriety and decided to support each other in their chosen paths. It is striking how similar, though not identical, are their personal lives. They were both sent to the finishing school in Warsaw. There, they were taught three languages, arithmetic, dance, piano and drawing. The curriculum was not rich, as Orzeszkowa later stated. It was rather suited to the expectations society had of genteel girls. Eliza came from a wealthy landed gentry, Maria from a so small town in Telegentia. The school, despite or maybe because of its limited curriculum, was fondly remembered by Orzeszkowa, who wrote when I read descriptions of finishing schools like those in Przedpiekle by Gabriela Zaporska and I contrast them with what I remember from my school, I'm surprised, shocked and very, very sad. The novel by Zaporska shows boarding schools for girls are pl as places where girls, because of the actions of cruel staff, suffer both from physical illnesses like anemia, tuberculosis or even anorexia and uh, psychological problems such as depression or anxiety. At school, both Konopnicka and Dozhoshkova wrote French, Polish and German papers for the school friends who were less interested in literature and languages. They did not become such good friends uh, that they'd keep in touch after they left school though. They both got absorbed with the lives they were meant to lead. When Eliza was still a schoolgirl, she knew that she was a very wealthy heiress, heir to Miłkowszczyzna estate and Grodno governorate, now in Belarus. She dreamed that she'd marry an honourable and poor gentleman. After many years, she sarcastically claimed that the only thing securing her popularity and high social position was her money. She wrote, I was the wealthiest girl in the whole governorate. A few months after leaving school, Eliza received a marriage offer from Piotr Orzeszko. He was her stepfather's cousin. He was more than twice her age. Eliza was 16. He loved hunting, parties and socialising. He was also deep in debt, as was his estate, Ludwinova. I think that if they dressed a tree stump in gentleman's clothes and told me that, it, that if I marry it, I will be my own mistress, I will do as I please and that it will take me on trips and to parties, I would have gladly married a tree stump," she wrote later about her teenage stage of mind. 
She was married in 1858 after five weeks of engagement. During that time, she did not have a chance to talk with her future husband face to face alone, even for five minutes. Eliza did not mind though. Her husband loved to have fun and the money in her dowry allowed them to have all the best fun. I was laughter, vanity and frivolity incarnate, she wrote in her diary. However, Eliza and Piotr stopped having so much fun after a rather short period of time. Maria Konopnicka's fate was quite similar. She got married in 1862 to Jarosław Konopnicki, a man from impoverished gentry, 12 years her senior. After the wedding, they lived in Bronowo, 50 kilometers from Łódź. Both women lived far away from each other. Konopnicka in the central part of the Russian partition, Orzeszkowa nearly 500 kilometers east. Konopnicka lived in a small house, rather like a tenant's home than a manor house, as she wrote. Jarosław, the oldest brother, was in charge of the family estate. Konopnica, Bronówek and Bronów. The estate was vast but neglected and did not yield profit. As Maria wrote to Eliza in 1879, When I got married, I took a tour of my new kingdom. Once in the attic, I found a stash of books that had been banished there a long time ago. They were used to prop broken furniture or left for mice to feed on, or maybe served as a source of kindling for two generations of ladies of the house. The books were not read, and Maria's passion for literature was thought strange. Similarly, as in the Orzeszko's household, there was a passion for extensive social life in Bronowo. Dinners, balls, hunts. Konopnicka was supposed to serve as a hostess in those occasions. Not only that, in the first ten years of marriage, Maria gave birth to eight children, six survived infancy. As she wrote to Eliza, Do I have a family? Yes, I have a husband, much older than me, who lives in the country. I have children. My God, a true gaggle of them. And yet, somehow, I feel as if I had no family. In 1863, January uprising broke out. Piotr Orzeszko was arrested by the Russians and sent to Siberia. He was sentenced because Orzeszko's servant was arrested first and he confessed that Piotr was hiding guerrilla fighters in his manner as well as Romuald Traugut, one of the most venerable uprising generals. Ludvinov was sold and Eliza Orzeszkova wrote to her friend, My husband was sentenced to exile in Perm Governorate. He will leave the country in a few weeks and I will follow soon after. Due to common custom, accompanying your husband to exile, even if one was not sentenced for any crime, was nothing strange. This is what women did, including the fiancé of Florent Orzeszko, Piotr's brother. What nobody expected was for Eliza to finally decide to let her husband go alone. Orzeszkova felt that her behaviour was something that she had to explain. Throughout the years, she gave different reasons in her letters and in her diary. In the letters, she usually tried to smooth the matter over. She wrote that this lack of sacrifice for a man who suffered for the cause was one of the worst ethical mistakes of my life. She wrote that she intended to fix this mistake, and it, but he came back shortly and died soon after. This is not true. Ozeszko came back and lived in Warsaw for seven years before his death. In the biography that Eliza wrote towards the end of her life, she admitted that the only reason why she did not let herself be exiled to Siberian prison was whatever the case, I did not follow my husband to Siberia because I did not love him. And that's all. Ozeszkova's behaviour was in direct opposition to all and any cultural and social norms for women of her class. In the eyes of her peers, not only did Eliza not fulfill her marital duties, she also did not fulfill her patriotic duties, choosing to go with her heart instead. The scandal was exacerbated even more in the following years as she spent a lot of time and money to get an annulment of her marriage from Piotr Rzeszko before he died. Maria Konopnicka suffered in the uprising as well. Her only brother, Jan, was killed in battle. Maria and Jarosław left the Polish lands with an infant son to go live in Vienna, probably fleeing the danger of imprisonment and exile themselves. Her marriage was also failing. Konopnicka could not stand the control her husband exerted over her. She did not want to be dependent on him financially and she did not feel satisfied with the role of a housemaker. After many years, she wrote to Ozeszkova that she was married off to a tired scoundrel and a man past his prime that made advantage of her naivete and young age. Yarosov in turn was not happy with his wife's literary interest as she debuted her poetry while they were still together. After 1872, sale of their ruined estate, Konopnitsi went to live in a lease estate of Gushin in Kalish Governorate. In 1876, Maria left her husband and a year later she moved with all her children in town to live in Warsaw. 
The separation, unlike that of Eliza, was somewhat amicable and did not cause a great controversy. Maria took the children, deciding that she can give them a better future in Warsaw than in Gushin. Orzeszkowa wrote to Tete Jesz, describing the period Konopnicka spent in the country bearing children as an obstacle to the development of her friend's marvellous literary talent. I've known Konopnicka for a long time because we were friends in the nuns finishing school in Warsaw. She's shown great promise as a child and then she disappeared in the country. She had six children, an estate to run and such. When she turned 30, she finally started to write. These quotes, both from Konopnicka and Dożeszkowa, who herself had no children, show how they distanced themselves from the figure of a Polish mother and how they thought that women can fulfill their ambition not only outside of motherhood, but even despite it. Konopnicka did not get an annulment, as Dożeszkowa did. She remained separated with her husband for many years and they never got back together. Maria spent all of her energy on taking care of her children and earning money to support them. She tutored, she translated French, German and English literature and, of course, she published her own articles and poems. Throughout her life, her children were her greatest worry, both financial and then personal. One of her daughters, Helena, probably suffered from mental problems, she was arrested repeatedly for theft and she had a child out of wedlock. Laura, Maria's youngest daughter, much to her mother's horror and embarrassment, became an actress. When Konopnicka learned that, she wrote letters to all of the theatre directors and her acquaintance that she could think of, urging them not to hire Laura because of her poor health and alleged tuberculosis. But they did hire her, and Laura became quite successful and respected in her own right. Konopnicka's life was not as scandalous as that of Wojciechowa, but she was also a focus of scandal a few times. She was heavily criticised because of her anti-clerical and pagan writings and poems. Conservative media called her a blasphemous heathen. Much to Wojciechowa's worry, who feared that Konopnicka will take those cruel reviews to heart and stop writing. Konopnicka separated from her husband. She was rumoured to have relationships with many people, for example, Jan Gadomski, a journalist 17 years younger than she was. One of her admirers, philosopher and historian Maximilian Gumplowicz, fell in love with the poet when uh, he was 33 and she was 55. He did not accept her refusal and in 1897 he shot himself in front of the hotel in Graz, where Konopnicka was staying at the time. He died in a hospital a short while later. The suicide was a great social scandal and Orzeszkowa came to visit Konopnicka in Graz to try and shield her from the resulting talks. In 1889, Konopnicka met a painter, Maria Dolembianka, and began their deep lifelong friendship. They travelled together to Austria, France, Germany, Italy and Switzerland when they went to alleviate some health problems that Konopnicka suffered from. They lived together for 20 years until Konopnicka's death in 1910. At that same time, Orzeszkowa was enduring the role of a social outcast that was set on her by some neighbours and acquaintances. Even in later years, she was not received in some conservative salons where bigotry and prudishness, as her friend Franciszek Godlewski wrote, prevented people from associating with such a radical. When Miłkowszczyzna, her family estate, was finally sold, Orzeszkowa, instead of moving in with her mother, decided to buy a house in Grodno where she stayed till the end of her life. Grodno was, uh, according to her own words, a parody of a city. It is there that she wrote most of her famous novels, where she received guests and where she wrote thousands of letters. It is there that Stanisław Nachorski lived as well and where he had his law practice. They also got married there. The bride was 53 at the time and the groom 68. They married in December 1894 after 30 years together. Until May of that year, Nahorski had a wife, Laokadia, who died finally from weak nerves. After their time together in finishing school, Maria and Eliza met for the second time in 1879. After Rzeszkowa read a few of Konopnicka's poems in press and contacted her because she wanted to print her work through her own publishing house. The two met and following that meeting, Maria wrote a long letter to Eliza detailing the events of her hard life. From then on, the two supported each other, if not in personal matters, then surely in their professional endeavours. Orzeszkowa wrote stellar recommendations of Konopnicka to the publisher Salomon Leventhal, backing up Maria Konopnicka as a candidate for the um, editor-in-chief of a newspaper, Schwit. 
She wrote about her to her many literary friends in Russia, trying to facilitate the translation of Konopnitska's poems to Russian. She also campaigned and gathered money for the organization of the 25th anniversary of Konopnitska's literary career. She managed to gather 20,000 crowns for the poet, who was always in dire financial straits. Konopnitska was also gifted a country house in Zarnovitz. Oshoshkova helped Konopnitska in personal problems, trying to find a job in a bank for one of her sons, Stanislav. Konopnitska was a regular and enthusiastic reviewer of Oshoshkova's novels. She was also active in the organization of the 40th anniversary of Oshoshkova's literary work, writing articles to the press and organizing funds from her acquaintances in the arts and culture circles. And yet they never became what we would call bosom friends. One of the obstacles were undoubtedly the differing lifestyles. Konopnitska lived in Warsaw and she devoted mo most of her time to writing and earning money to support her many children. Later, under the pressure of the scandal caused by her daughter Helena and her own failing health, she left to travel Europe. In 1903, uh, she moved to Dulembianka to the country house in Zarnowitz. Ozhoshkova, after the trials and tribulations of her youth, moved to Grodno and rarely left. These two parallel but not identical biographies had a hard time merging because of the personalities of both women. Klomtiska was an exceptionally distant and brief correspondent, whereas Ozhushkova maintained hundreds of relationships this way. After one long and open letter in 1879, the rest of Maria's letters are rather short and she often mentioned her reluctance to talk about herself and her personal problems. Ozhushkova wrote about Konopnitska. I truly like Konopnitska as a person and I admire her as a poet. When we meet, we kiss each other fondly and in earnest, but then we know nothing of each other for years. Konopnitska wrote to Ozhushkova in 1889. I'd like to write to you more, but then I don't want to bother you. I love you very much and I think about you fondly and often, even though I'm silent. The relationship between the two women was marred with their unusual position and the lives they led in direct contradiction with the customs of the time. Two women, one at the sea, the other separated. One living with a married man, the other connected to many people throughout her life. Both experienced financial troubles and sudden life changes because of the uprising. Both supported themselves independently in the social class that was not used to independent women. Both clear and loud in their favourable uh, views of women emancipation. It may be because of that that their relationship was so long and supportive, because it was based on the similarity of views and personal experiences. As Oshoshkova wrote to Konopnitska in 1898, we are both cut from the same cloth, both tragically ill-fitting, these three-yard creatures born for people to marvel at and sorrows to feed on.